if you open. So welcome everybody. Good evening uh, for those of you who are in China. Good afternoon for those of you who are based in Europe. Welcome to our first session of uh, Living and Working. Uh, today we will be in China between Beijing and Shanghai, basically. And uh, it's a, a privilege and an honor to introduce you to Hervé Machneau, who is uh, the president of the China uh, chapter of Sciences Po Alumni. And uh, so, Hervé, merci uh, de votre présence. Uh, um, I give you now the floor to introduce the, the Chinese chapter of Sciences Po Alumni, and then we will have three uh, brilliant uh, alumni living and working in China that will share their experiences with us. Thank you very much, and Hervé, the floor is yours. Thank you, Camilla. It's very nice to be to be able to be present from China to this important meeting. Uh, the the chapter in China it's uh, around maybe uh, 40, uh, 350, 350 uh, alumni. Um, there is two main uh, parts, one in Beijing with uh, probably uh, 100 and the rest, the most important in Shanghai, which is uh, very well animated by my uh, uh, Zoe Jo and Yachi, who is here to, tonight. Uh, I believe that thank you very much for organizing such kind of, uh, of uh, webinar because, uh, of course, it's much, it's very much important for the to, to make the link between uh, reality, you know, to, to see the country and the people in the country as they are. But even if it's so important to do it with every country, I think it's even more important with China. As a mis misunderstanding between uh, China and the rest of the world is by the time being so big. And uh, I very much hope that uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Esther, Antti, uh, Patrice will uh, give you a, a vivid impression of what is real, really China, and uh, how we can, you know, the, the of course, uh, the, the condition uh, of living and working and the dynamism of uh, the, 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 that country. So thank you, thank you, uh, Esther, Antti, and Patrice, and, and thank you, Diachi, to. To, uh, to be the, the moderator of that uh, webinar. So welcome all of you. Merci Hervé. Um, just a reminder, it is the first episode actually we started in Luxembourg, uh, in Austria, in Canada. This is, so now we are in China and for the future we will go to Senegal uh, Belgium, United States, and Germany. So uh, now we are um, in China, and uh, I give the floor to Jiai Ki Wan, who will be our moder moderator, and he will introduce all the, our speakers today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Camilla. So um, um, good evening and good afternoon, everyone who are watching us online. Um, allow me to quickly introduce myself. I'm Jiai Wang. I graduated from Sciences Po in 19, six, uh, 2016 uh, for Master's Finance and Strategy. Um, so I will be the moderator for uh, today's session. Um, I will probably first asking the three dear alumni here to give us a quick introduction, who you are, uh, where were your area of study back in Sciences Po, what do you do professionally speaking, uh, and what brought you to China, basically. So um, probably ladies first, I will start with uh, Anji. Yes, Anji, thanks. can you hear us? Yes, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes we can. Hello everyone, uh, good morning, good evening. My name is An Qi. I studied in PASI at Sciences Po, majoring in international economic policy with concentrations on energy in 2017. Upon graduation, I began to work at Allianz Investment Management Paris on ESG, 
It means environmental, social, and governance topics. Where I had my first permanent job as a sustainable investment analyst, I was with Allianz for three years and seven months, and I returned back to China last year, exactly around this time. Then I began to work at GIZ, the German Development Agency, as technical advisor on its climate finance project. The reason that I chose China, I would say mainly it is a job at GIZ that brought me to China, brought me back to China. Firstly, as Chinese national, I have always wanted to work on climate change topics directly related to China. Before at Allianz, I focused mainly on European market. Secondly, the COVID-19 crisis also let me kind of recognize in a hard way the important role a public sector or the government could play. And GIZ is such a good platform for me to get a glimpse into the public policymaking sphere as our project nature is international cooperation at ministry level on different topics between Germany, Europe, and China. And speaking of my city choice, I, I don't love Shanghai less. It's just a specific job. Now it's based in Beijing, so I'm currently in Beijing. Yeah, nice to meet you all. Back to you, Jiaqi. Okay, thanks, Anxi. And uh, what about you, Esther? The floor is yours. Hey, everybody. My name is Esther. I come from Barcelona, and I studied at Sciences Po a uh, double degree uh, with uh, Fudan University on um, Europe and Asia in global affairs. I graduated in 2017. And uh, basically, I got an internship at the European Chamber in my uh, last few months uh, in Pudan. And I kind of stayed there. Um, I, I found a job in Beijing. Um, I, you know, it was a bit hard, I have to say, uh, to, to make the decision to move out from Shanghai because it's an amazing city. But uh, I uh, came to very much love Beijing. Um, and I've been with the European Chamber and with a new funded project uh, that is implemented by the European Chamber, the EU SME Center, uh, since then, really, since uh, the beginning of uh, 2018. Um, I would say that my job is really the dream job uh, for somebody who has studied uh, this uh, double degree, uh, Europe and Asia in Global Affairs. I mean, it's, it's just the perfect fit. Uh, for me, I look after the um, policy aspects uh, related to the interaction uh, with European stakeholders, uh, obviously the EU, but also uh, member states. And uh, I also look after certain sectoral issues such as technical standardization, which is a very hot topic these days, uh, and uh, SMEs. Um, why China? I, I studied languages uh, in my undergrad. And one of the ones that I tried, I mean, I still try with Chinese, it's uh, life is too short to learn Chinese. Um, but uh, yeah, Chinese was one of the languages that I chose uh, for my undergrad. And I always knew that I wanted to have some living experience in China. Um, and it has turned out to be very valuable. So yeah, that's me. Great. Thanks, Esther. You mentioned the food I didn't mention the food, but now that you mention it, yes, the food is amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, seems the internet connection is not very stable from my side, sorry. So you mentioned the um, Sciences Po Fudan double degree. We'll talk about that later on. So our third guest, Patrice, could you quickly introduce to the audience about yourself? Yeah, great pleasure. and. Uh... Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Camilla, Hervé, and uh, Jackie. It's a great, great pleasure to be able to meet all uh, the alumni and, uh, and the Sciences Po fellows and to be able to, to, to share you know, a bit of our time together, even with uh, all of these uh, different geographies. Um, so my, um, uh, I started in, uh, in Sciences Po, actually, I, I got my graduation in Sciences Po in uh, 99, so <laughs> make me probably the, me the, the oldest uh, here to, to, to give some testimony. And uh, not only I got my, my diploma at that time, but also I started to work at Sciences Po because my first work experience was to create a company, uh, internet company, and at the time I, I didn't have any computer, so I, I actually uh, 
created the company from Sciences Po Computer on a Sciences Po network. And I was coming every weekend <laughs> to create the company there. Um, and, and that was my first you know, work experience. And it worked uh, OK, because we sold the company later to um, MCs uh, Group, you know, which is a French uh, TV channel. Um, and then um, I, I continued to, to, to work um, on the brand side and also entrepreneur side. On the, on the brand side, I joined a company called BNP Paribas. And I, uh, I work on strategy and innovation for 11 years, uh, half of the time in France in the innovation center and uh, the other half in China, uh, where I set up the innovation center for, for Asia Pacific in 2007. Um, and then, so I, um, I did that for, for five years. Um, and then I quit the bank uh, because I had to come back to France, but I wanted to stay in China. Uh, so I created my company uh, in 2013 and I sold it uh, three years later to a company called Faber Novel, which is a company that uh, employs me now. Um, and and uh, since um, since then, so I, I, I continue to develop a bit uh, with this company. Uh, 2018, I created um, an office in Singapore. And 2019, I took over the international activities with uh, San Francisco and, and uh, Barcelona. Uh, um, and Lisbon, sorry, not Barcelona. <laughs> um, I would love to go to Barcelona and to have an office there, but uh, Lisbon is not bad. Uh, and um, and last year I opened in uh, in uh, Casablanca, Morocco, and, and Lebanon. Uh, so I'm in China since the last uh, 14 years. And uh, so what uh, drives me in China is I can say it's passion, <laughs> uh, passion because uh, because I was extremely curious uh, and still about the future. And uh, at the time I thought the future will be in China, and I still believe that you know, the future is in China. And passion also because I met my wife in France, uh, who happened to be Chinese. I know it was uh, natural for us to continue to live, you know, from France to China. So like a double passion for me to, to be in China and, and to stay in China. Thanks, Patrice. What a wonderful professional experience. I didn't know before that you have your office everywhere in the world. Probably later on, you could share with us what's the... Uh, uh, unique advantage of your office in, in Shanghai compared to the other geographies. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I will go back to maybe Anqi. Um, so, um, as a Chinese student, uh, I was wondering, probably you could share with the audience, what did Sciences Po education offer to you? Or, or, or in another way, what, to what extent did you benefit uh, from your experience in Sciences Po that currently apply to your uh, working job uh, currently? Thanks, Yachi. Um, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about, because um, every time and then I was asked this question, and every time I just, I felt I was, I would just be really excited to share my, my thoughts. My genuine thoughts is that I really, really love Sciences Po. And I, I, I could say that I never felt bored for one second at Sciences Po. So each day, every day, I still remember vividly the days we spent on the campus with classmates, with professors, discussing all the interesting topics. So I think there are three uh, dimensions in which Sciences Po has helped me to both group uh, personally and group professionally. One is that Sciences Po helped me to discover my professional fashion, pro professional passion. So during my study at Sciences Po, I participated in a team project with uh, Transparency International. It's an environmental advocacy um, organization. And the thematic was public participation and efficiency of climate finance project. So I went to, uh, actually our team went to COP21 with, uh, with the officer at Transparency International at that time. You know, I also did energy and climate related research in my bachelor, but it was really because that that time my professor assigned this topic to me. It was really until I, I, I uh, entered Sciences Po and, and had this um, experience and all the discussion with professor and like-minded students, I began to realize that climate change is really the call that I want to fight for. Um, then secondly, I think Sciences Po also kind of gave me the courage to pursue what I believe it is the right thing to do. Um, 
back at that time, the sustainability ESG topic was not that trendy compared to now, but I was just really interested in this field. And then I discussed with my professor and some fellow classmates, they all just kind of encouraged me. I would just chase what I believe it is the right thing to do. And then I, I, took, the, I took their example, I took their advice. So I accepted opportunity firstly to work at Allianz as a system investment analyst. And then eventually it also helped me to uh, land a job at GIZ. And then thirdly, I would say Salesforce also equipped me with the capacity to pursue all this. At that time, I remember, remember we have many very interdisciplinary courses. We have the leading academics, we have very sophisticated practitioners, we have um, events um, held by different guests from all works of life. And it gives you really a refreshing perspective to look at these things. You, when you look at the climate change topics, you really look at that through different um, angles, through finance, economics, international relations, energy, environmental economics, all this. And this kind of helped me in my professional career because I get to constantly work uh, work with different experts from different fields and I and I feel that this curiosity nurturing sensible has never died in me I, I each and every day I feel that I'm just a very proud and um, happy sensible graduate yeah thanks yeah and so it seems like you're very passionate in climate change sustainability um, in not only from your academic experience in sport, but also in your career-wise. So today, as a technical advisor of climate finance for a uh, uh, Sino-German corporation called GIZ, so what is your feeling on climate finance area? Um, what is the difference between Europe and China's mindset in this area? Would you like to share a bit with us? Yeah. Um, thanks, Yachi, for the question. Um, I would say climate finance is definitely one of the most interesting interdisciplinary topics of our time. You know, when I was at Allianz, we were always talking about climate risk adjusted return, meaning that we do believe or we hope that by incorporating climate considerations into our investment decision making process, we can have at least market rate of financial return. So it's kind of a taboo to say that we are having like less financial return because we are doing the good thing, we are doing ESG, we are taking into consideration of climate. And we are always saying we are not doing philanthropy things. We are a commercial and institutional investor. We need to, we need to uh, fulfill our fiduciary duty. And it's all about return and having this environmental impact at the same time. And then now I GIZ, actually our project budget counts as part of Germany's commitment as a developed country to contribute to this US dollar 100 billion climate finance under the UNF C agreement, meaning that the United Nations framework on uh, climate change. So our project's funding comes as grant. Well, other channels such as multilateral development banks like ADB or AIB, typically they provide concessional loans. So you'll say the spectrum of climate finance is just vast. You have both types. You have private climate finance. They are eagering for both profit and environmental impacts. And then you have other public climate finance. And people are talking about, well, we should not push our project on a very much on very hard terms. We should give more grants than the concessional loans. And also there exists um, blended finance. Basically, public entities take the riskier part of the project for the funding scheme and crawled in private investors. And in all this process to, to source a deal, to, to assess a project, to close the pipeline, to implement it on the ground as climate finance professional or sustainable investment analyst, whichever you want to call that because different organizations, they have different titles named for this kind of interdisciplinary uh, interface or position. You've got to work directly or indirectly with climate scientists, industry experts, risk experts, and portfolio managers, et cetera. And I think it is not Jack, it's not like the saying, it's kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. It's really depending on your organization type. The core strengths need is very different. If I'm with as manager, I will focus really a lot on issue or level analysis. If I'm with an asset owner, I will work more on the portfolio level. And if I'm with service provider, like anyone who provides climate scenario analysis, I would do a lot of modeling. And today I would say after my uh, my, my rather, um, uh, 
strange experience in, in, in France and now uh, just one year experience in China. I would say on the aspect of climate finance, in my opinion, Europe is ahead of China, but China is quickly uh, catching up. I think the main reasons behind this um, different uh, different speed is is back to your question, Jiaqi, as the corporate man side, because in Europe you really have this kind of hybrid momentum. So both top down and bottom up. You bottom up, you have the initiatives coming from civil societies, from the uh, institutional investors. But in China, it's more like uh, regulatory driven, so it's more top down. And when you uh, kind of have uh, not as hybrid as this European uh, approach, then you, you kind of lose some momentum in, in the beginning phase. But now in China, because the regulatory pressure is quickly adding up. So I see many Chinese companies, they are also um, kind of uh, very interested in this area and they're pulling a lot of resource on that. And then the second different thing would be transparency and disclosure. I would argue that transparency has its inherent value. And in, 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 your, in Europe, uh, especially in France, because of the NGO scrutiny, you have a lot of transparency, especially when it comes to climate related data. So we have a lot of data to, to, to put into use, to do that, to, to form the metrics, do the research, but it's not exactly the case in China. Even sometimes when we want to replicate the same metrics, we have the formula, but we don't find the data to plug in and to get a result. And the third thing is about public engagement and public awareness. These are intercorrelated. It's, and it's, it links kind of back to the second thing I mentioned, the transparency and disclosure. It's exactly because in China, the transparency and disclosure still needs to improve. And then I feel like, especially for the climate change, climate finance topic, the public engagement awareness is relatively low compared with compared with European companies because the public they don't get materials to talk about and the mainstream media they don't kind of actively covering on, on that on that aspect and then the last thing I would like to compare is maybe more like the recognition of this uh, climate finance as an interdisciplinary topics in, in, in EU or in France in, take take my example when we hire system investment analysts, we really look for uh, interdisciplinary background. And we have the preference to, to say that if we are in an asset owner position, our ESG or system investment analysts they need to have at least environmental engineering uh, energy background. But in, in China, when I read some job positions and I see punk companies specifically, they want to hire PR professionals for this kind of position. So they don't really recognize the value of having an interdisciplinary talents in their company and it's, um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's improving. I, so on this aspect, I think Chinese companies can learn a lot from European companies and the two can definitely um, benefit each other. Yeah, thanks, Yachi. Thanks, Anchi. As always, your sharing is always insightful and technical. Um, uh, so that also, you, you, you mentioned the multidisciplinary uh, talent that uh, is much needed in the area of climate change, uh, climate risk and sustainability. That also re echoes a lot of recently I read an article about it's not how to calculate the commercial gain in the short term, but also to calculate the long time loss if you do not apply those risk uh, climate risk management across your, your, your business, no matter in which sectors. Thanks a lot, Anchi. Um, so, um, Esther, so you are the senior business manager of European Union Chamber of Commerce in China, and you also mentioned that you did the dual degree of Fudan and Sciences Po. Could you help us to draw the connection between the two? I mean, how did the double degree uh, help your career in China first? Right. Um, so first of all, I would say that I, uh, I am completely on board with everything that Anti said. I think that uh, Sciences Po was a fantastic uh, learning experience. And for me personally, um, I mean, there were, there, there were different aspects, right? Uh, there was just the joy of being with people that, you know, thought and, 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 and cared about similar issues as I did. And of course, there were the classes, but I think that one of the uh, one of the things about Sianspo that I valued the most was um, that it gave me um, 
the uh, incentive, the passion to take up new challenges. When I came, uh, when I came to Sciences Po, I was coming in uh, from a uh, languages background, um, so I didn't, I didn't know much about, uh, I don't know, law, economics, politics. So my learning curve at Sciences Po was uh, very steep. And I just enjoyed every bit of it. And I think that I have taken uh, these, uh, this passion for challenges uh, all throughout my career. And, and again, I mean, I think, I think that's something that, that really started with Sciences Po. In terms of the specifics and uh, more practical uh, areas uh, through which uh, Sciences Po helped me uh, get where I am, I mean, Obviously, like the choices of university, uh, Sciences Po plus Fudan uh, were very useful when it came to uh, my job search. Uh, Sciences Po is one of the top universities in the world, and so is Fudan. And in, in China, Fudan is very prestigious. Um, so I'll, I'll advance here that looking for a job as a foreigner in China is really not easy. And it's becoming increasingly uh, difficult. It was becoming increasingly difficult uh, before COVID-19. But, but in my case, because I had been to these two very uh, prestigious universities, I didn't necessarily have to have the two years of experience that would have otherwise been required of me if I, uh, if I wanted to apply. Uh, to a job in China. So yeah, that, 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 was, that was definitely very helpful. Okay, thanks Esther. So you are saying there's a requirement of minimum two years of experience before applying? At least, when I, at least when, I, when, I applied, uh, when I applied to, um, to uh, my job, but then uh, this requirement can be waived uh, if you come from certain university. That are okay, sort of that's a very practical hundred. information. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and for that, is really one of them. And so is Sian School. So, yeah, again, very helpful yeah. for yeah. me. Preston yeah. University always get exemptions anyway. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. So, back to your uh, professional uh, uh, sector, Esther. So, your organization represents European companies in China and bring their concerns and recommendations uh, to Chinese and European uh, policymakers, especially. So, how do especially these days in the COVID area and also in the geopolitical uh, um, area, how do European business perceive doing business in China, particularly nowadays in 2021? So I feel, I feel that, my, uh, that my intervention is going to be a bit, uh, a bit uh, dark uh, given, given the times uh, and COVID-19, especially when it comes to people mobility. So I'll start with the positives first. Uh, positives first. Uh, to begin with, in terms of uh, trade flows, the EU and China trade 1 billion euros per day. That's a huge, huge, huge amount. Of course, there is uh, a trading balance between the two, the two um, stakeholders, but um, very, very profitable. Very, very uh, good trade. Um, both the EU and China are each other's second or third respectively um, market destination for exports. And uh, China is, as, as, our, as our president says, China is a fitness club for European companies. If you are a multinational that you are, and, and you're not in China, you're not really a global company. China is a very dynamic market. Uh, Anxi has talked a bit about the, um, about these different speeds. China speed is, is something else, especially for European companies. Um, consumer base is demanding, it pushes for innovation. Um, and and in more, more in general, like the innovative environment in China is, is also uh, quite dynamic. Um, it's, it's, it's a growing economy, even, even uh, with the economic slowdown that has been going on in the past few years, it's still, it's still growing. Uh, looking at uh, GDP per capita, and maybe now I will just share my screen. Looking at GDP per capita, um, China is currently at 15,000 uh, US dollars, according to the World Bank, um, uh, in terms of GDP per capita. Even if China doesn't uh, doesn't change course 
uh, in the coming in the coming 20 or 30 years by 2050 it will be at 46,000 uh, US dollars um, that's that's a huge that's a huge in incentive uh, for, for European companies. So this is the good news. The bad news is that uh, China is increasingly on a course of self-reliance. Uh, that means that for a, a variety of reasons, some legitimate like national security or the geopolitical, the worsening geopolitical uh, environment, uh, China is uh, looking at, um, again, becoming more uh, self-reliant, that is uh, enhancing its own capabilities in areas where it perceives uh, um, it, it is weak, particularly in strategic areas. So you may have heard uh, of, of, of issues like, or pushes like in areas of like semiconductors. Um, so, so, so that's, that's the situation. And um, these increasing self-reliance means that China is going to lose out. I mean, there, there is going to be a cost, and you can see this in the um, in the screen that I'm that I'm sharing you. There is a cost to this uh, self reliance push of twenty one thousand nine hundred and sixty U.S. dollars uh, GDP per capita. So you multiply this uh, for by um, one point four billion people, and it, I mean, you know, China could do so much better if. If it uh, if it uh, didn't necessarily like completely close uh, down, um, another another uh, area that I wanted to highlight and that is very relevant for us uh, as um, international students and uh, young graduates is that even before COVID nineteen, uh, European companies, which are of course like uh, you know one of one of the groups that hire that are more likely to hire uh, European uh, graduates, they were seeing 35% uh, were seeing a decrease in the number of, of foreign nationals uh, working in, in the company. That, of course, can be explained by uh, the extremely good and capable uh, graduates that China has, but it can also be explained by uh, the gradual closing up of, uh, of the country. And especially that has been the case since COVID-19. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking with students. I don't know how many of you have double degrees with Chinese universities. I can't imagine, I mean, how, how, how complicated it, may, it must be for you um, to, to be doing these double degrees uh, all online because China is, is closed up. And if you look at, if you look at um, China and its relationship with foreign populations as a whole, you will see that out of, uh, according to the latest data, out of 1.4 billion uh, people, um, there were like, what, 800,000 foreigners? The foreign population of Beijing and Shanghai combined is less than the foreign population in Luxembourg. So there is definitely a room, like a lot of room for improvement in terms of people to people exchanges between uh, China and, and uh, other, other countries and the EU in particular. And this is becoming more urgent as public uh, opinion on China in uh, Western countries is, is declining. I mean, if you look at the latest Pew Research data, you will see that, for instance, in Germany, uh, negative public opinion on China has gone from 37% in 2002 to 71%. In France, 72%. I mean, in, 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 in Sweden, it's like 80%. Uh, it's crazy. So, so I mean, there, there, there is value to these uh, to these uh, people to people exchanges. And uh, at this time, I would say that they are uh, more needed than ever. So this is the negative. Uh, I promise. I promise. I, I will bring some some positive energy uh, in 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 the coming interventions. Sure. Anyway, I, we we really appreciate the uh, the two sides analysis, pros and cons, typical science way of thinking. That's very comprehensive. Especially provides a very comprehensive view for the audience before they decide to come to China. It's really, really impressive, thanks. 
And also Esther, as a final quick question for you to wrap up, um, as a foreign national, you know, apart from the, the linguistic capacity of obviously of Chinese, what other knowledge and experience and skills do they need if they want to work in China? All right. So first of all, I feel that I finished uh, I finished the, the, the last question in a rather uh, depressing note. So so let me I, I don't want to discourage anybody uh, from uh, studying uh, China or from uh, going to China to work. That's far, far, far uh, from my, my, my intentions. And so I will say that uh, on the positive note, uh, China has become uh, the topic du jour in, I mean, pretty much everywhere in the world. And so um, there is a real demand uh, in, 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 in geographies like Europe for uh, people with China expertise. Um, so, I mean, if, 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 if you're studying a double degree with Chinese university or um, anything related to China, that's, that's, I would say that's, that's, a, that's a very good career uh, choice and uh, it, will, it, will, it will serve you well uh, in the future. Uh, now, in terms of uh, working in China, of course, Ch having, having uh, a good command of Chinese is becoming more and more necessary as time uh, goes by and as um, the uh, competitive like, competition within, uh, within the job uh, market in China becomes uh, stronger. So as a foreigner, you have, you have to think that as a foreigner, a company will have to go through a lot of trouble. Um, to hire you. Uh, you, you will have to, you have to, to like have your visa and your work permit. So, so it's, it's, it's a big investment uh, for, for a company uh, or an organization to bring you in as a foreign national in China. It's, it's, it's not easy. So definitely having the language is just a basic. And another thing, and another thing that I would that I would add, is uh, as a young graduate, having a specific field of knowledge um, is, is 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 going to be very uh, helpful uh, to you. For instance, Anti uh, has has this uh, this uh, very um, uh, very uh, hot kind of uh, expertise these days uh, on ESGs. Um, when, when you look at how China um, treats uh, foreign investment and foreign companies these days, uh, you will see that you kind of have to be useful as a company to, to, to China. And I think, and I think that that's, um, if, you, if, you, if you want to work in China as a foreign national, you need to find out where your strengths are in terms of knowledge, in terms of skills, and you need to showcase them the job market is savage. <laughs> it's intense. Um, so um, that, that those those would be my two main recommendations. And of course, for me, uh, again, like starting my career in China just as I was winding down uh, from uh, my studies, and I was already in China. Uh, that was really helpful to me because, again, I was already there. Didn't, I didn't have to go back to Europe or I didn't have to apply from Europe. It's really helpful to, to look for a job uh, if, if you're already in China. That of course is uh, very difficult these days, uh, but you know, whenever China decides to reopen its borders, uh, I, I, I would say that it's something to take into consideration. Try to find a job or an internship while you are in China because it, it may be a bit more complicated. And I, last point is, uh, I absolutely recommend to anybody with an interest in China to live in China and to work in China. Um, if that for any reason is not possible, I think that the, um, the job market for uh, China expertise in Europe is growing, as I mentioned. So I think that there will be uh, a lot of opportunities in Europe to work with China experts in lieu of, you know, being able to uh, work in China, at least for the moment. 
ancestor. So to wrap up uh, being in China physically, try to that helps if possible. That helps a lot. You know, apart from uh, mastering the language and also try to strengthen your key competencies and key skills. To in the business, what we said the product market fit, but in this case we would say self competition competency market fit. Try to find the area where you can shine as a professional. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Esther. So the floor is to our final guest, but not the least, definitely. So Batis,、um, so you are the managing partner of、uh, marketing tech Fabio Noel. You are taking charge of international strategy and operations, and people are al- always very wondering、uh, on your exper- entrepreneurial experience. What makes you want to start、uh, create your startup in China? You mentioned it before, but could you provide me or us some more details? It was, it was great pleasure,、uh, and the funny thing is,、uh, originally it was really not the plan. <laughs>、uh, you know, my background is uh, is uh, is uh, I've been trained as an economist before coming to Sciences Po, and my plan was to become civil servant,、uh, and I had the idea that you know I could you know have a relaxed, <laughs> professional experience, you know don't work too much, and maybe have time for you know.、Um, My passions, etc., and、um, and then I joined Sciences Po in、uh, '98, actually、uh, in October. In October, I joined Sciences Po in Paris.、Um, I got my first email. I discovered internet the same year.、Uh, November, I created my internet company. So a month later, <laughs> uh, and everything changed.、Uh, I was not、uh, going to be a civil servant anymore. I was、uh, starting to work, even though I I was. Not even、uh, graduated.、Uh, so, so yeah, I created a, a company in China, but I think I got the virus, you know,、uh, at the very beginning,、uh, back in nineteen ninety eight, and I discovered a totally new way of、um, working. And maybe the fact that maybe the ideal job is not the job that will be served to you by a company, but maybe the job that you design yourself and you can actually. Create by yourself, like creating the company that will <laughs> make your ideal job. So,、um, so when I joined、uh, the bank、uh, BNP Paribas, so、uh, I had still that in mind, and that also, I guess, changed my career there. I stayed like eleven、uh, years,、um, and I realized that also inside a big corporation, you can actually be an entrepreneur. You can be an intrapreneur. You can have the Opportunity to、uh, establish new businesses or to develop, you know,、um, new activities in different geographies, and this is what I had the chance to do.、Uh, I joined in, a, I think, one of the smallest、um, subsidiary of the bank、uh, called、uh, Latudi, which was a kind of、uh, market intelligence unit. We were like twelve people,、um, and the company was supposed to. I mean, the unit was supposed to become a company, and I joined、uh, BNP Paribas to help actually this little unit to become a company and to start to sell services outside of the group.、Uh, um, so by doing that, so I, I started to、um, uh, sell services and to become an entrepreneur again. My first year in in the bank,、um, and ultimately I realized that、uh, maybe a, a great client could be the the. The major、uh, stakeholder of, of 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 this unit, which was、um, which was the bank itself, so I started to advise the、um, strategy department of the group about how to have a better internet strategy, inter- intranet strategy, and I joined the the strategy department、uh, along with the M and A team.、Uh, we build up a very small team to manage、um, the internet strategy and to realign the strategy、um, of of the bank. Um, and then、uh, I had the chance to be able to go to China, as I explained before,、uh, to set up this、uh, innovation unit、uh, in Shanghai.、Um, so I did my first trip in 2005, and I and I realized that.、Uh, so it was a blow, you know, for me first. <laughs> this trip to China,、uh, and we are preparing the for the Olympics,、um, the Shanghai Expo in 2010, and I, I could only only feel the. 
the the the, the all these internet companies alipay and, and, and coming alipay was only four years old at the time it was still small but i could feel that how it will uh, shake the world uh, at the time um, so so i had the chance with the bank to to go in china and to develop this uh, Kind of observatory, you know, um, unit, um, and because I I, I I like to work with people, and I was alone observing things uh, from 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 Shanghai and reporting to the headquarters. Um, I decided actually to support not only the bank but also um, the client of the bank, um, and to help them to better understand China. So I started to sell services so I could recruit. Um, business analyst and I could work with a team. <laughs> so I ended up to work with a team of uh, 15 business analysts and to explore other boundaries. Um, at the time, so luxury was starting to become a very big topic. Uh, uh, Chinese people started to um, travel uh, and to shop, you know, in uh, Hermes and uh, Dior, like overseas. So it, it was starting to become big. Um, and then I, I realized that maybe my best job or the next big job will be to work um, in China, but I was already there, to work on digital innovation, but I was already working there, but to focus on luxury. So I thought, okay, maybe what will happen in between these uh, three elements will be interesting. I have no idea about what will happen, <laughs> but I want to be there. So uh, I was expatriated and I was supposed to come back to France. But uh, and it was only five years that I was in, in China. So and China, five years is, seems very short actually. So uh, I thought about okay, I, I cannot come back to France. You know, it's just happening. It's just the beginning, and uh, there is something even bigger that will happen. You know, between luxury, China, and digital innovation. Uh, let's go there. So I created my company at that time. But you see that I had the virus back in '98, so, and I had this experience with Latelier BNP Paribas to become entrepreneur and to have the experience of building, you know, uh, to do what we call the, the zero to one. So you start with nothing, and then you have to build everything, uh, and that's very difficult uh, usually. So I, I, I already did that like twice before I set up my, my, my company called Velvet uh, back in 2013. So I had this experience a bit before, uh, so I guess it helped me to manage uh, not to crash the business <laughs> immediately. And my ambition was actually trying not to crash. Uh, it was not to succeed. I said, okay, I'm going to leave a very big company. I will be all by myself. Uh, nobody will be willing to work with me anymore. Uh, so if I don't crash after a year, it's, it's, it's great. I will be so happy. <laughs> Um, but eventually, uh, it, it worked much better than before. Uh, and I realized something very important that maybe along those years, I, I, with my clients and other companies, I built something which was not tangible, which was trust. Um, so I had a lot of company that were telling me, you know, we don't care about the name of your company, you know, just call it a Nordic company or as you want, you know, we work together uh, since a long time. We know each other since you know, 10 years. Uh, let's continue to work together. So um, I was really, um, I mean, I had a lot of chance to have, you know, build this trust, but I realized it was uh, the value of that when I was actually alone with my company. Um, and I managed to have like, to have like very nice projects. Um, uh, I work with, um, the PPR group, what was named PPR group at the time, which was renaming as a caring group. And they had to change their name to, you know, to this uh, caring and, and Kaiyun in Chinese. And they, they needed to have a global communication, including in China, of course, which for them was extremely interesting and important and critical. Um, so it was one of my first projects to manage the corporate communication on social media for like, a group like uh, the caring group. Um, so at the time, so what I was doing uh, for this agency was to do um, what we call content marketing, so mainly on social media, so basically to tell the story of luxury brands in China. Uh, and my Chinese level at the time was okay, but not at the level I could write or I could really. So it was a, another challenge to actually being able to work with uh, Chinese colleagues. 
um, that could you know, really um, like craft stories uh, and explain to a Chinese audience, you know, the whole heritage of these luxury companies. Um, in, 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 and, and to do that uh, with my venture. So it was another challenge, uh, but, but as entrepreneur, there's a lot of things that you realize, but uh, one of them is, uh, there's so many things that you think you cannot do, but actually <laughs> you can do them. Um, so it was another thing that I, I, I thought I couldn't do and uh, it, it finally happened. Uh, and, and finally, after I had the chance to be able maybe to sell my company after a year, um, and I realized that probably it was a bit too early and I had so many in my head that I wanted to develop, it was not there yet, uh, develop as a company. So um, I, 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 I decided to focus on my business for, for the upcoming two years and to give me at least three years to develop the business. Uh, and then I had a chance to, to meet Fabien Novel, which is an innovation uh, agency that combine um, things that usually you can never combine in, under one roof. Uh, so they combine like a consulting and strategy, and this is where I'm coming from. Um, they also combine uh, marketing, uh, which was I, I built with Velvet, um, and I think it's very essential for a company. Uh, to really be able to be you know, um, consumer centric, and they, and they, then they have takes so one third of the company actually software uh, engineers. So 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 they are also doers. So so I didn't think I could find a company that could combine what I, I was trying to combine also in my small company. Uh, so when I joined, we are like uh, maybe twelve person. It was uh, four years ago now. Uh, and, and I had the chance to join this company. And uh, as I explained, so I developed the business uh, in China and uh, in, um, in other offices. Uh, last year, I had the chance also to um, buy another company together with Fabio Novel. So it was another interesting experience to, on the other side of the mirror, I, sell my, I sold my company to them, but together we bought another company. Uh, so now we have an office in China with uh, 60 person. And uh, over the last 14 years in China, I probably recruited uh, uh, hundreds of uh, people in my civil, um, civil, civil companies. So, um, so uh, I anticipate to your next question, which is uh, about uh, uh, why or do you, uh, do you uh, recommend to, 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 to people or young graduates to, to go to China? Uh, am I right, Kachi? Yes, <laughs> or flowing your mind? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. I mean, I mean, there's no person in this panel other than you who are more qualified to answer this question since you also yeah. mentioned yourself who recruited hundreds of people and you have offices in six countries, right? So, so, so probably you could answer the following two questions together, but he's okay. uh, conscious of time. So first is, uh, what do you recommend to the young audience who want to come to China, who want to succeed in China? And second is, I want to touch upon on the digital innovation you mentioned mm -hmm. before, the content strategy, marketing technology, uh, as a broader digital innovation in China, how do you feel the market trend compared to, to like Western markets, say yeah. Europe or America? Yes. Big question. <laughs> On the <laughs> first question, uh, what to advise? Um, I have many things you know to advise, but uh, maybe the most important is you know, follow your dream, follow your passion. You know, you're never as good as you know, uh, when you, you are passionate. Uh, so don't listen too much others. Don't listen too much about the big trends because your trajectory might not follow the, the mainstream you know, uh, things. Uh, it's not, it's, 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 you can do a lot of things that are maybe like, um, not in the trends, but, uh, but, but you can still do it. So don't listen too much like people like me or <laughs> that give advice, listen to you a lot. Um, and then I think the most important is to be very aligned into what you like and, and your work because it's taking so much of your time. And to know what is the ideal work, I think you need to know yourself. Uh, that's the most important. Uh, I, I thought, you know, my dream work would be like a civil servant. I was so wrong. Uh, 
uh, I could have done such a big mistake. I realize now, but at the time it was really not clear. Uh, so, so yes, yeah, so so there to do things, uh, you can only fail. Uh, and actually, I, I think you ne you never fail. You know, uh, either you win or you learn, but you really never fail. I mean, uh, if if you get something out of it, uh, I, I I I I fail many things uh, on my side, many many things. Uh, but I just learn a bit more each time. So um, so come to China. Uh, if you're interested about the country, come to China and you will see when you will be here. Uh, China is a fantastic country, is a fantastic country. Um, and, and, and there is the state or the, and there is people, it's, it's totally different things. You know, uh, uh, at some point, you know, during the Trump administration, we had so much, you know, uh, American bashing, etc. but American people are, are great. <laughs> so we just have to make sure we don't, you know, um, uh, mistake about how we see the country. So, so come to China because Chinese people are, are just great, and, and the rest is just okay politics or things like, like this. Um, and uh, there is things that we can change. Things we cannot change. But uh, as foreigners, uh, I don't know many countries that welcome as well foreigners as China. Uh, really, uh, to be a foreigner in China is a uh, is, uh, is, 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 uh, is a very nice experience. There's so many countries where as a foreigner already you are um, considered you know, a bit lower than national people, which is not the case in China. And sometimes it's even not fair. I feel that we are considered a bit better than uh, you know, uh, Chinese people. So, uh, so I cannot complain about that. And I think, yeah, um, uh, you have to come to China. Um, the, the future is here or part of the future is here. There's so much different things uh, that we know in the West and just knowing a, a bit of two side uh, make you better. Uh, and there is so few and uh, I think um, it has been um, explained there's um, fewer and fewer foreigners. So, so it's very important for foreigners who are in China that, that can give a vision about what's happening here because they have, um, they have the trust from, you know, their, um, from their, um, people in, in their original country. And they give probably a much better vision than what they can see on the news in the media. So their role and their responsibility is, is also, I think, very important about what they, what they see, what they say. Um, so yeah, so that's for the first question. <laughs> I don't want to be too long. Um, then, so innovation and, and digital. Um, I don't even know where to start because that's my topic and I've been following you know, innovation trends in China for the last uh, 14 years. I do remember that the first question I had at the, at the beginning was, do you really think that China is an innovative country? <laughs> that China can innovate, you know, uh, they just copy everything. Um, so that was a big question before. I think that it's not a question anymore at all. Uh, and probably we can see that at least in digital innovation, there is many things where China lead. Um, it's not good or bad. It's just like this. It's a, it's, it's a trend. Um, but a lot, a lot um, more and more people come to China not only to sell to Chinese, uh, and, and they not only see the China as a market, uh, but they also come to China to learn about the future. And uh, before COVID, I had the chance to organize what we call learning expeditions, uh, which are actually a business trip where you bring decision makers um, so they can uh, discover the country. And, uh, and I was doing that a lot. At some point, I was doing between three to five a month. And I think I've worked with most of the um, CAC 40. Um, and I was telling them, I don't want to sell you a study. Come to China <laughs> because you will really touch, you know, um, and, and, and sense, you know, what is, what is the country and how things are evolving. Um, and many of them, and I don't, I won't give names, but many of them um, don't have any intention to develop their business in China. They just come in China to try to understand um, some innovation or some uh, new things or things that maybe will never be developed in other countries because they are so endemic and specific here. And I, and I had that in energy, in transportation, in finance, um, in uh, retail, uh, many, many industries where actually uh, China is, is leading. 
um, and it's probably the still the beginning, uh, still the beginning. Uh, but again, it's um, uh, there's not. Um, uh, I think it's 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 interesting to see that, and uh, and um, and also to have such a big country to have its own share in two global innovation. Um, but the thing I think is not also to antagonize you know, things, and uh, there is no competition about is China more innovative than US or Europe. Um, innovation is all about sharing. And, uh, and we have a lot of things that happen in Silicon Valley uh, where we have offices and can be developed in China and then uh, coming back to US and Facebook will maybe uh, be inspired by uh, WeChat and have new, um, new ideas for that. And it's just good. Uh, it's just a good thing. So um, I think now we have more dynamic. Uh, it's, uh, we have two uh, superpower in terms of uh, digital uh, powerhouse. Um, I, I, I hope we would have more. I, my, my, if I have a concern uh, is for Europe to have the capability or ability to also propose to um, the world like an alternative way to, um, to manage data or to you know, develop e-commerce or to drive you know, maybe more sustainable innovation because something that I think we're also very uh, uh, aware in, in, in Europe. Um, so um, yeah, a lot of innovation in China, but, uh, but it's, it's a global game. Uh, so it's not, it's not, it's not a fight. <laughs> uh, it's, it's typically a, a place where I think we should avoid to have too much uh, fight. Wow, very sincere um, answer, Patrice. I, while listening to your sharing, I see not only me, but also all the other guests keep nodding their heads because we cannot agree more on your opinion about the, uh, it's, it's not like a two separate world, but in terms of technology, it's all, all about sharing. And in terms of whether coming to China or not, of course, it's a personal choice, but uh, knowing what's happening on the other side of the world is always, can always make you a more well-rounded person. So thanks a lot for your sharing, Batis. So yeah, conscious of time, we probably gonna leave the floor to the audience. Um, if you have any question or remarks to ask to the guests, don't hesitate to uh, probably type in in the chat bar directly, or you can voice out if there are any questions. I actually have a question, if I might jump in. Yes, please. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. So thank you for, for all the good advices and insight for this uh, China uh, conference. And I have a question. I actually don't speak Chinese but Japanese. So I was wondering to what extent is it possible, might it help to, to speak another Asian language? And yeah, and how bad is it not to speak Chinese? That's my question. Even if we all just speak a little bit about this already. I, I can I can try and uh, let other participants if you want. It's uh, actually I, I learned Japanese before learning Chinese, <laughs> uh, and I thought that uh, Japanese was difficult, but uh, it was just before I, I tried to learn Chinese. So, um, so I think it will be definitely an advantage for you um, to already you know uh, because there's a lot of common elements at least you know the way you write and in terms of uh, structure and. Uh, um, and is it disqualifying for you not to really speak Chinese if you're in China? I would say no. Or well, things have changed, you know, um, uh, along the time. So I would say um, less now than before, and, and it's not disqualifying. Uh, specifically, if if you're in Shanghai, in some other cities, might be a bit different. I know that in Beijing, uh, it's already a bit different. You you have to be a bit more. Um, uh, not fluent, but at least to have a minimum level of Chinese to, to be able to communicate because less people will speak with you in, in English. Uh, but things are changing very, very fast. So um, it's not a problem. You come to China, motivation, the only thing to learn Chinese is motivation. And if you are uh, uh, in China, you can start to learn from China and you have the whole environment. You, you can already start to master pretty fast. Um, so don't make it a blocking point. 
that's some, uh, my recommendation. Yes, if I may, if I may add, I I would agree with you, Patrice. Um, it's not it's not a blocking point. I mean, it shouldn't dampen your uh, uh, your enthusiasm or willingness to go to China. Um, there are jobs uh, where it is possible for a foreigner to uh, have, you know, a fighting chance to 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 get those jobs even uh, without Chinese, um, maybe, uh, maybe uh, for, for, I don't know, like for certain specific areas, like, um, like jobs that uh, require like knowledge of, of another language, like French or, or Japanese in your case, um, editing maybe, uh, marketing. It is, it is possible, it is possible, it is, just becoming more common of our requirement uh, in JDs in China to um, ask applicants to verify their, their level of Chinese. Um, but it is still possible to find a job in China with a limited level of Chinese, just a bit more difficult than before. And again, it depends, it depends on what you on what you would want to do and which uh, sectors, which which area of expertise and which company as well, or organization. I thought you're gonna say probably come to China first and then start <laughs> applying. <laughs> no. I mean, you know, if you're if you're studying in China, that's 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 definitely possible. Um, and that, that's definitely what I would recommend if if you are able to get to China. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll okay. see when that will be possible. Anything to add, uh, Anchi? Yeah, I could also quickly testify, like if you apply uh, for jobs at GIZ China, you don't need to speak Chinese. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from the audience you may have? Uh, I think I saw a message from Simon. Uh, so I will read out the message. Quickly, um, so Simon said, I'm a student in media, communication, and creative industries, doing a double degree with Fudan University. I'm specifically interested in entertainment industry. Wow, interesting. Film, television, social media. Are there many professional opportunities for foreigners in China's entertainment sector, or is it more difficult than other sectors like finance, tech, etc.? If yes, do you know what these opportunities precisely are? and what are the requirements are, thank you. Wow, so for the entertainment industry, probably Patrice, you have uh, any idea to help Simon? Yeah, I will try, <laughs> Simon. Uh, first, first uh, yeah, the, the media communication and creative industry I think is a, is a, great, um, is a great track. Um, so there is several things. So uh, you, you correlate, you know, the regulated, um, some regulated industry and the difficulty for you to work there. It might not be the case. Like entertainment is definitely extremely regulated, like every media, but also finance and some other. Um, so that's 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 one. But but doesn't mean that you no know, foreigners are not welcome to to work there. Um, so, so yeah, I think you, you the, the, there are some opportunities. Um, I mean, every, and even entertainment is a very big industry. Uh, if you want to work, I don't know, as a, in, a, in, a, in a media and a reporting uh, about China to foreign media, that's a possibility, for instance. And I have a lot of friends who are journalists, they are here. Um, and, and they work for uh, foreign media. Um, or um, these are the other people who are also writers, and I have some in my team. They are copywriters. They they work on social media um, for for companies. So it's more like professional writing. Um, then, in terms of entertaining, you have all these you know um, park and uh, you know um, uh, entertaining park like uh, could be a Disney park or like uh, we have you know the, the Puy du Fou who is uh, starting in, in China uh, but we have Pierre Vacances uh, we have a lot of things like this um, and those organizations actually also require uh, professionals working um, 
in their company and, and being uh, foreigners. Uh, uh, Club Med is, on, uh, is another one. And uh, one of the promise of Club Med is actually to have uh, professionals who are welcoming guests who are actually non-Chinese and they expect to see non-Chinese. Uh, so this is more like close to, you know, the uh, hospitality, you know, entertainment industry. Um, and a lot of foreigners are uh, well welcome and uh, appreciated. Um, I work also a lot with the hospitality industry. I don't know if you classify as an entertainment, maybe less, but you know, the Ecole de Lausanne, etc. So there's some signature schools as well that also will um, be very um, demanded. Uh, for by foreigners, so to, so I think there's many many things depend what you target, but uh, again, so make uh, you have to make your case <laughs> to find you know, where you are good, uh, where you know what you like, and 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 um, and, and focus on that. Uh, okay, so, so that would be my, my my recommendation. I don't know if it, uh, it helps, uh, Simon. Uh, any recommendation from your side, uh, Esther, and Anshi afterwards? I mean, I would I would tend to agree. Uh, if if you're interested in media, then then there are of course jobs in foreign media. I have to say as well that there are plenty of jobs uh, in Chinese media that uh, have expanded in the past few years in their um, outreach efforts to English speaking audiences. It, these mm -hmm. exist as well, and then. It is, it is, it is growing. I think. Um, other than that, I, 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 I don't have much uh, more to add. Um, what about you, Anchi? Yeah, I also have no further to compliment. Thank you. Okay, so probably conscious of time because we're already one fifteen minutes uh, late. Uh, probably I will go give the floor back to Camilia. You wanted to deliver some uh, remarks, final remarks. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you very much to Esther and Ki and Patrice. It was, for me, very interesting because uh, I am not at all a specialist on China. And I, I discovered a lot of uh, very useful information. So I hope that everyone of you enjoyed all this sharing. and. Most importantly, I understood that it is very, very important that we, we continue to build this interaction between uh, Europe and China. So this was, in our small <laughs> uh, part, it was a contribution to this kind of uh, diplomatic and cultural uh, bonds between uh, Europe and China. In this context, we're traveling, especially for, for young uh, students and graduates, is very difficult. So. Uh, this can be a sort of um, complementary experience uh, uh, apart from uh, online uh, studying, etc. So thank you very much. It was very, um, uh, very, very useful and uh, very interesting to hear your views from inside uh, China. And uh, please um, follow us. Uh, our um, project of living and working in a different country will continue, as I told you before. So stay tuned on um, Science Po alumni website. And uh, also, if you're interested to Chinese activities, um, there is the, the, China's, uh, the China chapter on Science Po alumni website. And maybe, Hervé, I don't know if you have already a a date for your next conference, but I, I'm a, I, I know that there will be one uh, in, uh, in the coming uh, weeks or months. So the, the, next, yes. the next, yeah. one, next one will be in Shanghai in, uh, on the uh, 18th of November. Great, because I see that you are very dynamic and very active in uh, well, to Yachi uh, and Zoe are very din dynamic. Speaking of Zoe, oh, yes. Okay. So, yes, I, I was just late for the conference and I touched a lot of uh, interesting things uh, said by the speakers. And I want to really thank to uh, Camilia who has invested a lot of time and effort to organize this um, conference and give us, give China uh, alumni to uh, share all this experience. 
And uh, I think we don't have a lot of time. So I ask Jiaqi to show you a, li a little bit of the view in Shanghai. So I think that maybe can attract everyone to come to Shanghai. In Shanghai, you can, if you don't speak Chinese, you can live it very well. And we have a very beautiful view here. So we try to show you the most beautiful view of Shanghai, if you can see it. And welcome to Shanghai. Probably not that, Probably not that clear. That clear. <laughs> you need to close the light. Yeah, perfect. This is the Lu Jiazui area, the uh, CBD of uh, Shanghai. And the, the pear tower of Shanghai. Amazing. Very nice. Oh, that's all. Yeah. And I hope next time we can organize the, the, this kind of conference next time with different speaker with you, Camilla. And uh, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for all the guest speakers. Thank you, Camilla. Thanks, Edwe. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for the invitation. Congratulations. You have been very good. Excellent. Very yes, very clear. And <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. And why do not hesitate to send us uh, the information about your next uh, event in Shanghai, so we can. Yeah, in, I think in two days we will send the invitation. <laughs> okay, great. We are still, still working on the program. <laughs> great. Thank okay. you very much. Bye bye. bye.